Welcome to my video. I'll trust you'll find it helpful and informative. Please remember to like and subscribe. Thank you. In this video for financial statements as offered by the ICB, I'm going to look at the year end accounting for a sole proprietorship. And you will see there at the top, I reminded you that this is always in assignment two. It's always in assignment three, and it is always in the exam. And in fact, this is the most important question that you will get in financial statements. Um, it counts about 80 marks in the exam. That's out of 180. And so the bottom line is you can do this question and you pass, or you cannot do this question and you will fail. Um, I'm going to do the question in three parts. So in this part, I'm only going to look at the question and at the journalized adjustments. And then afterwards, I will look at the income statement and the balance sheet. So when you get a question like this, the first thing that you will get is you will get the list of accounts for the year as it ended. So this is really your pre-adjusted trial balance. So you get a lot of information here and then you get additional information and adjust adjustments that you must do. Now there's about 14 here and each one of the 14 requires a journal entry. Now in order to make it easier for myself, if I see the, saw the information, if it require acquire uh, if it included sorry if it included an amount or it included the percentage i just put it here in a different column so that when i do my calculations or my reasoning rather for the journalized adjustments then i can just refer back to the cell and so for then i know that i will not be making a mistake so the way we are going to do it is we are going to look at each one of these uh, adjustments on its own, and then we are going to record it in this journalized adjustments tab. So, okay, let's have a look at what the first thing is that we are supposed to do. It says provide for depreciation as follows. On plant and machinery, 16% per annum on cost. Note that new plant and machinery costing 40000 was purchased on the 1st of August, misspelled there, and this has been properly recorded. Let me just fix that in case you think I'm dyslexic. And then secondly, on motor vehicles, which is depreciated at 18% per annum, but in this case on the reducing balance method. So it's really two entries that's required here. One, the depreciation on plant and machinery, and the other, the depreciation on motor vehicles. So, okay, let's go and have a look and do this. Now, you see the way I've done it here? I'm going to give you the reasoning, and then we are going to record the transaction. So let's have a look here at the reasoning. Okay. So we start by saying what is on the books for um, plant for plant. So let's have a look here. So we go and look at the books here. We will see that plant and machinery is one forty eight five hundred. So that is a good place to start. We say okay, that is indeed. Um, sorry, that's the wrong line. Not a problem. That is indeed 148,500. We also were told that we bought new plant and machinery on the 1st of August. Okay, I don't know why I've got that um, as P and S. Okay, got a couple of things to fix here. Okay, plant and machinery on the books, 148,500. And we know that we bought new plant and machinery on the 1st of August. Now, from the 1st of August until the end of March is indeed eight months. So that 
part of the plant and machinery. That 40,000 was only able to depreciate for eight months at the 16%. So if we do the calculation there, we will say, okay, let's take the 40,000, divide it by 12, multiply it by eight, and then multiply it with 16%. So that part, that 40,000 worth of plant and machinery depreciated with 4266 during the year. We also know that the difference between the two, the rest of the amount that's on the books, which is obviously just 108,500, that depreciated for the full year at 16%. So when we calculate that, we get 17,360. And then, of course, we simply add the two together. Now that we have that, we are able to provide for the depreciation. Okay. Now, all the dates are going to be the 31st. And you don't have to worry about these document numbers. You were not given them. I just started at some point and continue. And the reason for that is so that later on when I go to the income statement and the balance sheet, that I'm able to cross-reference and tell you which journal entry it is that I took into account. But you don't have to worry about it for now. Okay. So obviously we're looking at depreciation because that's what we are supposed to provide for. The contra account is the accumulated depreciation for plant and machinery. We are going to debit that 21,626 uh, and uh, against depreciation, and we are going to credit the accumulated depreciation. Why? Because really, when we look at our income statement, we are going to treat depreciation as an expense item, and therefore it must be debited. But we are not done with the information we were given in that first portion. We were also told the following that we must provide for depreciation on motor vehicles. So same reasoning here, we go and look for the motor vehicles on the book. Um, now, in this case, we we don't have to worry about it because there was no motor vehicle acquisitions during the year. We didn't get rid of any vehicles. So the only thing we have to do is we will say, okay, the accumulated depreciation on motor vehicles on the books is 27,918. So both the motor vehicle value at cost and the accumulated depreciation, it's on the books. We use the accumulated depreciation for the motor vehicles because remember, we have to calculate this at the diminishing balance. Just to show you there. Um, so if we go and look here, at accumulated depreciation for motor vehicles, there it is, and the book vehicle, book value for motor vehicles, there it is. I'm not lying to you, it is just there. Okay, then of course, we are going to subtract the accumulated depreciation from the book value because that was our book value at the beginning of the year. And then we are going to multiply that with 18%, and then we see that that comes to 22,892. And then the same thing here, our date, not, I don't think I put the date every time. I, I didn't, um, because it will all be for the 31st. But here we will say again, that's the depreciation. This is the accumulated depreciation on motor vehicles. We are going to debit the depreciation with the 22,892, and we are going to credit the accumulated depreciation on motor vehicles. Okay, now we have dealt with the first adjustment. Now let's go and look at the second thing that is required. It says to us, a debtor, a Kalaman, who he owed us a little bit of money, not a lot, he has been declared insolvent. The business received 45 cents in the rand. Now 45 cents in the rand is exactly the same as 45%. Uh, this transaction must still be recorded. So the income of 45 cents in the rand must still be recorded. And the rest of the debt must be written off as irrecoverable so that this debtor, A. Callum and his account can be cleared. So let's go and have a look at this. Okay. The reasoning is simple. He owed 668 rand and 45% 
of that was recovered. So we can simply go and calculate that. And then we do, we can record the transaction in the journal. Obviously, the money is paid into the bank account. The contract account is the trade receivables. It's coming off his account. And uh, we can simply add the amount. The obviously, bank is debited and trade receivables is credited. But that also, once again, not the end of this transaction because they specifically said to us that um, the rest of this must be written off as irrecoverable. So we received the 300. We must subtract it from the amount that he owed us. And we say that, see that that is 367. Okay. Once again, I'm just going to do all this in one fell sweep here. We can now just go and record that transaction. Credit losses debited, trade receivables credited. Uh, I mean, cre credit losses debited, trade receivable credited, so that his account is now cleared. Okay. After all, the man is bankrupt. Okay, now we had dealt with the second adjustment. And we can go on to the third, which says an allowance for credit losses of 1% of trade receivables should be maintained. So we are saying, you know what, um, experience has told us that 1% of our trade receivables uh, are most likely going to be written off as bad debt. But um, hey, let's see if the let's make a plan for that. So we go here. Now follow the reasoning here very carefully. Firstly, we go and we look at the debtor's control on the books. Remember, it will be on the books. Okay, let's go and find it here. Debtor's control, 14.850. Okay, I'm going to stop coming back here to the pre-adjusted trial balance now. I think you, if I say I saw it on the books, you will from now on know where I found it. So let's just go here. So the debtor's control on the books is the 14850. Second thing that we have to do is we now have to remove Kalaman. Okay, because we just we just took him out of the book. So let's remove him. Okay, the entire amount, the entire 668 that he was owing. Okay. The next thing we must do, he must now provide for one percent on the difference. Okay, so the difference there is 14,881 and 1% 1 will obviously be 141 rand and a couple of cents. Not a problem. Okay. Next thing we have to do is we have to look at the allowance for credit losses on the books. And the allowance for credit losses on our books was 297. And now we can record the adjustment. But now look here. Um, on the books, we have the allowance as 297, but that's actually more than what we need. And so, therefore, we are going to record this difference as an income. Okay, the 155. And then we simply go here and we record that transaction. Okay, we say what's the allowance for credit losses? And what's the adjustment? So in this case, the adjustment will be debited because we are treating that as an income. Uh, will be credited, sorry, because we are treating that as an income. And therefore, the allowance for credit losses will be debited. Okay. Now we're going to work, do much the same thing for the next transaction uh, or the next adjustment. And the next adjustment says, allow adjust the allowance for settlement discount granted to 2% of good book debtors. Okay, following, follow the reason again. Okay, first thing, we must subtract this 1% from the good debtors. Why? Because we said that um, it's the good debtors that we are making a provision for to give them a 2% discount. Um, if a guy is a bad debtor, we can't possibly give him a discount. It's not even in our books anymore. So so therefore, we um, work with that 1% there. And so 
the good letters in on the books was 14181, but we must now subtract that from uh, the um, from the, that one that 141 rand that we calculated here, we must subtract from the 14181. Okay, then the next thing that we have to do is we must calculate 2% of that. And if we calculate 2% of that, uh, we get 280 Rand. Okay. Next thing we have to do is we must subtract the allowance for settlement discounts on the books. Okay. So the allowance for settlement discount on the books, we can just go back to the books. That is 178 Rand. But now, in this case, look what's happening. The 178 on the books is less than the 280 that we want. Uh, that we want. And so, therefore, now we are going to record the difference again, as we did the previous time. But this time, we are going to record that difference as an expense. Because it's an adjustment is an additional amount. Because on the books, there's only 178, and really we almost need a little bit more than 100 rand there. So now, when we do this transaction and we journalize it, the allowance for settlement discount adjustment is the amount that is going to be debited, and the allowance that we grant is going to be credited. Okay. Then, the next one is quite simple. It says the following. The 210 Rand has been received in cash from a debtor whose account was previously written off as irrecoverable and the entry must still be made. So we're gonna, just going to record it as that. We're going to say, okay, um, let's have a look here. Obviously, the money is going to go into our bank account. So bank is going to be debited with the amount given. Credit losses recovered will be credited as the contra account. No problem with that. Okay. There's no reasoning to follow there. The money just came to our bank. We wanted what it was for. And we see, saw that it was a credit loss that was recovered. The next one is here. The rights and services for March has not been paid. Okay. And it's the end of the year. It must be paid, but we didn't pay it yet. So let's make sure that we record that transaction. Now, here there is a reasoning, well, a very difficult reason. I only said to you, accrued expenses is a liability. And therefore, it will form part of our trade payables. Okay, so what do we do? We say, well, rights and services is an expense that will therefore be debited. And the accrued expenses will be the same amount as the contract account. And now we have a couple of these types of transactions where an amount that was due has not been paid or something that is not due yet has been paid. And we are going to um, work with all of that. The same. Now, I don't know why. For the others, I had it in red and here I kept it in black. Ah, for the sake of transparency and everything looking the same and beauty, let's just keep in the red. Okay, so the, this one now um, is where we see the prepaid expense. Okay, so what's happening here? Let's have a look. The insurance for April has already been paid. It wasn't due, but we paid it in advance. So when we journalize that in Justin, we're going to take that prepaid expense as an asset and it will really form part of our trade receivables okay so it's a prepaid expense but um, the which is insurance expense but that insurance expense was uh, is, is credited and the prepaid expense is then simply debited now we're going to have something that's, uh, similar here for accrued income, let's just have a look what that accrued income is. The rent for March has not been received yet. So we rent out something and uh, we haven't received that rent yet. So we just 
make that adjustment there. Now I'm going to do it in one sweep because we have the amount and everything. So we have accrued income, which is rent income. And uh, we record that transaction. And then the last one here in this range of little transaction is the packaging income for April. It's only March, but we've received the packaging April already. So we're going to take, treat it as a liability. We are going to record the transaction. Income received in advance. And that is also... So you have four of these types of transactions. Either where something that was not due has been received or something that is due is not received or we didn't make a payment or we received. Okay, so you get the idea. Now have a look here at the next one which is actually quite straightforward. It says an invoice has been received now here on the end of the month from HR Plumbing Services. And again, I made a spelling error there. Okay. Um, for the, where's, where's that one now? Uh, the plumbing. Okay. The amount of 1285.52 has been received for plumbing services and it's something that uh, we were not aware of. And so now we go and we simply record the transaction. Once again, there's no reasoning there. It's just repairs and maintenance, which is our expense uh, against that um, trade payable HR plumbing. And we must just record the transaction. Nothing spectacular there. Then the next one, it says here an amount of 5.4823 was paid to RSA transporters for delivery by rail of trading inventory. It was debited to the delivery expense account in error, and it must now be corrected. Okay. The trading inventory to which the rail is related has not been sold. Okay. The reason they tell us the trading inventory to which it relates has not been sold, you will see why it's important when we do transaction number 13. Okay, but just keep it in mind for now. So basically, um, clearly what's happening here is we are making use of a perpetual inventory system, but the bookkeeper or the clerk thought that it was a periodic one, and so that is why the mistake was made, and so it must just be rectified. So when we rectify it, we simply say, okay, Delivery expense that was previously debited must now indeed be credited, and let's debit the correct account, which is trading inventory. It's all that's happening there. Next one, it says the owner took trading inventory for personal use, and then they do what they always do. They give us the selling price, and they tell us how the markup work. And in this case, the markup is 70% on the selling price, and we must record the transaction. Well, he's taking, so it's going to be a drawing. And uh, what, he's, what he's taking is inventory. So now let's have a look here. The reasoning first. The markup on 70% sales is given. Okay. So... That is, is that the amount that was given? Let me just see. Um, yeah, that's the amount we start with, the, 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 the sales price as it was. Now, we know that the sales price, therefore, includes the 70% profit. So to get to the um, cost price of the goods that he has taken, we have to multiply it with 0.3% because 100% minus 70% is 30%. Oh, sorry. Didn't want to do that. And then we get an amount there of 564. That's really the cost price value of the inventory that he took. So there's the drawing for that amount that's going to be debited. And of course, trading inventory has decreased. So that is going to be credited okay now we get to the next one where they say to us that we had a stock take and when we did the stock take we found the following trading inventory to the value of 8062 now this trading inventory here to the value of 8062 will now obviously include this amount of 548 because they said to us 
that it has not yet been sold. So just keep that in mind. Shop consumables and postage and stationery. That's what our stock take came up with. So first thing, we will have to go and look at our opening inventory as it is given. And that is 9075. And you say to me, where on earth was that given? Because we don't see it. But I say go back here. And you see that the trading inventory on our books is 9075. So that we are going to treat as our opening inventory. Okay. Less the drawings. Because remember, that was on the books and, and the drawing wasn't recorded yet. So he then goes our owner and he draws trading inventory to the tune of 564. But then we discovered that there was an error. There's additional trading inventory that we bought, but it was erroneously treated as a delivery expense. So that must now be added. Okay. And then we can simply get to the total there. What's it? Something. Oh, okay. Less the closing inventory. Sorry. Because we want to see if to find out what our cost of sales was. Closing inventory is given to us. That's what happened during the stock take. And now we can say, so, okay, if we take our opening inventory, less the drawings, plus the A error, less the closing, clo closing inventory, we're going to find an amount there of 969. And now we can record this transaction. Okay. And the way we do it is the first thing that we do is we say consumable stores on hand include both the shop consumables and the postage and stationery. Those two were given. Oh, what is wrong here? Um, oh, okay, I see. Um, that's right. Didn't, didn't, didn't break them down. It is just the sum of these two. Remember, if we go and we look here. Okay, we see that shop consumables was 2145 and postage and stationery was 980. So we simply add the two together to get 3125. And then we must still deal with the cost of sales. And of course, the contra account there will be inventory. And that is the amount we just calculated there, the 996.4. Oh, sorry, guys. My mouse is playing up. And we can just add that amount there. Then the last transaction that we have to look at is it says here, provide for interest on the mortgage bond. Interest is calculated at 12% per annum. The liability was increased by 60,000 on September the 2018. There were no additional loans or repayments during the financial year, but 12 end of month installments of 1,512 are due to be repaid on the loan starting at the end of April, which is in our following financial year. So now when we provide for interest on the mortgage bond, we're not going to work with this 1,512. We are going to park this amount for later, but we are definitely going to look at the 60,000. So how what's happening here? Okay, let's follow the reasoning. The bond, as it appears on our pre-adjusted trial balance, is 165000 Now, what we know is that that amount includes 60000 Okay? Um, but that 60000 part of it, would only have drawn interest for seven months because it was increased on the 1st of September. So from September to March, to the end of March, is seven months. And so the, that would have only accrued interest for seven months. So what do we do there? We take the amount, we divide it by 12, multiply it by seven, and multiply it with a percentage of 12%, which we were told. So that's for two. But the rest of the amount, obviously, that would have uh, drawn interest for the entire year. So the, we subtract the 60 from the 165, we get 105, and then we just multiply that with 12%, and we get 12,600, which for some reason has a different format than the others because the rand is missing, not that it matters at all. And then we can 
add the two together and we get 16,800. And then we can record the transaction like following. We'll say interest on the bank loan. It's really an expense of 16,800. And that is also an accrued expense because we didn't make that payment, okay? Um, it's it's interest that accrued, but we, we didn't make the payment yet. And therefore it is accrued uh, expenses. And then when we get so far, we did this first part of the of the question that said journalize the adjustments. Uh, the subsidiary journals have been closed off already, recorded in the general journal, and that is indeed what we did here. Okay. Okay, guys, I hope that was helpful. Um, so when I do the second and the third part, I will look at the income statement and the balance sheet. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you found it valuable, please subscribe and like. Thank you.